In this video we're going to look at the influence of charge compensation on XPS spectra. The need for charge compensation occurs when we analyse samples that are insulators. And the problem is that when electrons leave a surface and there is no means for electrons to return to the surface, as would be the case for a conducting material, then a positive charge builds up on the surface and this attracts electrons back to the surface, which means that any photoemission electrons then appear with a lower kinetic energy than you would expect for a given photoemission line. And to correct for this issue, electrons or other charged particles are returned to the surface in order to compensate for the fact that electrons are leaving the surface. And in this case, this is an example of PET that has been measured using a given set of charge compensation settings, it's produced a set of peaks that appear at a higher kinetic energy than you might expect. This indicates that the surface has a uniform potential because we have nicely shaped peaks but they are negative so the electrons that are emitted are accelerated away from the sample. When performing charge compensation for a sample the two important characteristics are that the charge state is stable that any perturbation to the system does not result in a movement in this charge state and secondly that this charge distribution is uniform. Now it is possible to have a stable state which is non-uniform and this can cause problems in terms of peak widths and shapes that we see within the data that could be interpreted as chemical state when in reality it's a peak that has been moved as a consequence of a different charge state across the sample surface. As an example of a perturbation to the state of a sample, the file that you see here is a set of measurements that are measured from a cobalt oxide and a set of narrow scan regions have been repeated many times. The dwell time for each one of these scans is 50 milliseconds, but these have been repeated many times so that if we look at an individual spectrum, the individual spectra look rather noisy. But if you were to take en masse all of these spectra and sum the information in these data, then you would end up with a spectrum with the signal-to-noise that would be typical for a measurement of cobalt oxide. It's easier, though, to see the influence of the charge compensation if we look at the oxygen peak. And the oxygen peak is moving around. We can see here that the oxygen signal is not stable and these represent small perturbations in this steady state at the beginning of each one of these acquisitions, or at least that's what we hope, because in order to do charge correction on this type of data set, we need to make the assumption that the sequence of measurements that are all in the same row all have the same charge state. The underlying assumption when we perform charge correction is that we can identify a peak and a position for that peak that we can assign a binding energy. And then once we've assigned a binding energy for one of these peaks, we can uh, calculate an offset which can be applied to other spectra in the same row, representing data that were collected under the identical charge state conditions. So in order to process this data file so that we can sum the data bins in terms of binding energy and produce better quality spectra, what we need to do is calculate an offset for each one of these oxygen 1s spectra that will allow us to then calibrate each row in turn and hence produce a better quality set of narrow scan spectra than we would if we simply sum these data as given. In order to calibrate on a row by row basis we need a peak model and a component within a peak model to specify the binding energy for that peak and that will allow us to calculate the offset. So I will now choose one of these spectra and create a rudimentary peak model. I don't really know all of the components that ought to be within this oxygen but what I can see is a very significant peak structure here and what I propose to do is to fix the position of this peak within this type of envelope and then propagate that peak model to all of these oxygen on a spectra so that they can then be used in a calibration operation. Let's create 
a background. And with the background, we'll add components. I'm going to put three components in here and then say fit. I'd rather these be similar in forward half maxima. So I'll introduce a constraint between B and C, and they f then fit again. And using this as my model, the objective is to have this peak here stable within the peak model. So I'm going to link all of these components if I say lock that's locking the area into the forward half maximum and say lock I've locked the forward half maximum and then the position I'll say lock again so this will be my attempt at fixing a position for this first component in this peak model so if I propagate and then examine some of these other spectra once fitted. Indeed, what I'll do is overlay these. And then hopefully we can see we've got a peak model with some kind of description for this primary peak here. And what I need to do is then use the spectrum processing dialog window the calibration property page I need to specify an energy so I've specified 530 EV binding energy and what we'll do is shift all of these data in each row using the difference between the position for the first component on the property page we see here and the value that I've entered for the true value let me just tick the region and component adjust buttons so these will also be adjusted as part of this operation and then I can do this calculation that will apply to each row based on this first component so the only column I have selected in which all of the oxygen spectra have the same peak model defined in the same order and this will allow me to apply by row first component an offset that will apply to each row so I'm going to press this button and we can now see from the display that all of these components all align within the oxygen and by virtue of the apply by row first component each spectrum within each row of this data file for which the oxygen are selected will now have the same offset applied that aligned these components. If we wish to sum these data, we need to perform a number of operations. And one of these will be to copy the set of spectra into a new file and copy these data using the option to copy process data only. So now all the calibration processing has been preserved so when I overlay the data from the oxygen you can see that the peaks are aligned and the same alignment will be part of each one of these spectra that represent carbon or the cobalt 3s so now we can do one further operation that is on the spectrum processing dialog window and this is on the calculator property page we need to rebin these spectra because what we're going to do is calculate the sum of each column to produce a single spectrum for each one of these narrow scan regions and in order to do that summation we need to rebin the data so that the summation is a simple sum of each data bin so when I press the rebin selected VAMAS blocks a new data file is created 
and these are now the rebin spectra as indicated by the name and then if I select these I can then use the test data property page I can sum selected sample ID column all files so in this case I've just got one file selected and when I press this button I produce a new VAMAS file that now contains all of these narrow scan spectra that have been summed on the basis of the charge corrected data. Just to conclude, we'd like to demonstrate that these data that have been rebinned actually contain no artifacts due to charge compensation. So first let's look at the oxygen and if we go to the spectrum processing and the PCA property page and then generate factors we can see that the abstract factors that are calculated based on these oxygen data have almost no information in them other than noise. So that's good, that suggests that the oxygen was calculated correctly. So let's have another example, this is the carbon and again we can generate the abstract factors and again for the most part the higher abstract factors just look like noise so the only abstract factor of significance is the one that would be the same shape as the spectrum that we'd calculate by summing all of these data the analysis just performed is performed on the basis that the sample has a uniform potential and it is also in a steady state for the duration of the measurement. Now we may have the scenario where we have a steady state but we may not necessarily have a uniform distribution. And The example that I'll now illustrate is a material that is silicon oxide on silicon but the charge compensation combined with the sample itself produces more than one steady state that must be separated if we want to see spectra of significance to the chemistry of the sample. When presented with a sample the first measurement that is performed is typically that of a survey measurement and the survey measurement from this silicon oxide suggests that we have oxygen, carbon and silicon and so we might expect this to be a reasonable XPS measurement until we look a little bit closer and then we see that the peak here that is a carbon peak is about 5 EV wide which is too wide for the resolution of the instrument. So that's the first clue that we should investigate this sample in more detail. This survey spectrum is constructed from a set of images and these images are processed and provide signal at each pixel so that we have spatial spectra that is to say at each pixel there is a spectrum from which we can extract information about the oxygen, carbon and the silicon peaks. So if we create spectra at pixels from these data and then apply regions to each one of these peaks of interest so we've got an oxygen, carbon and silicon 2p that we can extract atomic concentration images so we know the intensity as a function of position for the oxygen, carbon and silicon and we can also extract information about the position of the peak in binding energy sense. So the binding energy of each one of these peaks may vary as a function of position and that's the type of information that we need to understand the consequences of charge compensation. So when we extract information as atomic concentration we get three images and these demonstrate that we have differences in the composition of this material as a function of position. So this is a heterogeneous sample. It's homogeneous within parts of this image so if we were to choose this patch here you can see that this has a common theme through each one of these images so that could be considered a homogeneous material and similarly if we were to analyze up here we might see a different spectrum from a different homogeneous material and we can see from these atomic concentrations that the carbon correlates with the oxygen and the oxygen 
can be viewed in terms of this silicon in the sense that the silicon is showing there's less silicon where there's more oxygen and more silicon where there's less oxygen so that would be consistent with a different film thickness of the oxide so the variation that we're seeing here is due to different film thicknesses of silicon oxide on silicon now the consequences for charge compensation we can look at another set of images that are constructed from the same regions on the same spectra at pixels only rather than extracting the intensity of these peaks the position of the peaks are calculated and presented for each oxygen carbon and silicon and once again we can see that the carbon and the oxygen correlate quite nicely however the silicon is anti-correlated and this is consistent in the sense that we understand this to be a silicon oxide on silicon because we can see the binding energy in the dark zone is corresponding to an elemental silicon and the binding energy for the brighter zones correspond to the oxide peak so this is consistent with silicon oxide on silicon and the fact that the carbon and the oxygen have structure is more concerning in terms of charge compensation because we can see especially from the carbon that there is a significant shift in the apparent binding energy as we go from the elemental silicon rich part to the oxide rich part of this sample given this carbon image we can make use of this to partition the intensities into a set of zones which we can use to construct spectra so we can add spectra pixels and produce spectra that correspond to different zones in this image so let's look at a partition and here we see the binding energies of the carbon s have been partitioned into different colors and these colors mark up different sections within this image so these two colors here are predominantly where the elemental silicon is dominant and these two colors are where the oxide is dominant so when we construct spectra from each one of these colors let's see here we end up with 10 spectra corresponding to the 10 colors and i've picked out the two that are highlighted in the image being from the elemental and the oxide zones now if we step through this looking at different parts of the spectrum we can see this is the carbon and the silicon peaks and you can see that not only is the carbon offset but some of these other peaks are offset too let me just step through some more that i've prepared this is the oxygen so you can see the oxygen has a separation which is consistent with the correlation of the oxygen and the carbon images so here we have two different samples effectively different film thicknesses of oxide of silicon on silicon and we find there's a shift in the peaks so these represent different potentials on the surface as a consequence of a different thickness of an oxide on a silicon so despite the apparent simplicity of this sample of a silicon oxide on silicon the fact that we have a variation in film thickness means that the charge compensation and the sample itself have contrived to give us two different potentials on the sample if we measure a total spectrum then we would end up with broad peaks if we choose small area analyses from different positions on the sample we'll obtain good quality spectra